Well, we're here with eminent behavior analyst and scientist Peter Killeen. Thank you for giving us our time, your time today. My pleasure. Um, so we're just wanting to ask you some questions about your history, and we'd like to start out asking what sort of events um, in your own history made you become a behavior analyst. Great question, and I like the way you phrased it, April. It wasn't like what made me, but you're looking at the discriminative and controlling stimuli in my life. And I, and I think it was pretty much like the life that Skinner described in the case history. It was a bunch of accidents that were lucky for me. So I started out as an undergraduate at Michigan State University and uh, took a learning class from a guy by the name of Ray Denny. And he was great fun. I liked that. I liked experimental psychology and took another one uh, on perception. And I loved what Stevens was doing, Smitty Stevens. And then another one in cognition, and George Miller was uh, mentioned for his magical number seven. I fell in love with that paper. So here I was as an undergraduate and uh, had all of these rich influences. I didn't want to get a job. I knew I was going to grad school. Where could I go? Well, there was one place that had Smitty Stevens, a power law guy, that had um, George Miller, the magical number seven guy, and had this guy, B.F. Skinner, that had all the cool operant relay racks in my college text. And I said, eh, if I don't like one, I can try the other. <laughs> so that got me under real stimulus control. And uh, the loudest and noisiest and most irreligious stimuli there were the kids in the operant lab. You know, the psychophysicists were meticulous, and the uh, cognitive psychologists were very cognitive but the behaviors were behaving all over the place. And I couldn't stay away. And it was a great bunch. Sometimes we're lucky to have be in a cohort that's special. Other times we slug along on our own and make it. But it's a great cohort. John Stadden had just left. Charlie Catania had left a couple years before. Um, Billy Baum and Howie Racklin were in their last years when I got there. Alan Nuringer and Bruce Schneider. Um, whom am I forgetting? Bob Bokes were just a year ahead of me. Jerry Zurath was in my class, a great book on behaviorism. And Ben Williams and Will Vaughn came in right after me. So I had this super saturated solution of people uh, arguing, building funny skinny Skinner boxes, all sorts of gizmos hung up on the Skinner boxes and on the relay racks. It was really uh, heavenly. It was very much uh, EAB, experimental analysis of behavior. You know, at that time, there, in the East, there wasn't that much uh, ABA, uh, applied behavior analysis. Um, but uh, it was good stuff. So I, I got addicted uh, to behaviorism at that point in time. And everything, one of the other classes I took at uh, uh, Michigan State was a seminar with Milton Rokich. And it was, um, he's, it was a good seminar. But he's the guy that wrote the book Three Christs of Ypsilanti. I don't know if you remember that. No. Um, there were three, uh, as we call them then, insane people in a, uh, in a ward in Ypsilanti, a city in Michigan. And he had the bright idea of putting them all together and letting them figure out who really was Christ. So he wrote this book about it. Now, it was fun and interesting. But somehow I knew that wasn't the kind of psychology for me, okay? <laughs> and the, I, I love data. Uh, I love the empirical orientation of behaviors. So it was a fait accompli at that point. Sounds like a delightful environment. It was. Well, how were you, how were you trained as a behavior analyst? You got in a little bit into that, but can you elaborate on it? Um, well, you see, you think of training as a behavior analyst, April, and I got none of that. And in fact, the faculty at Harvard were very laissez-faire. It was sort of a European model. You bring them there, you test them. If they survive, you give them a degree. And you're a model for them. But mentorship and training was not part of the deal. And so I got all my training, I think, from my fellow graduate students. And that's why I was especially lucky to have a, a smart and argumentative group of them. Uh, so. That was my training. Then when it comes to uh, behavior analysis in, in the field or applications, um, I pretty much learned that as I taught from books and talking to folks. But um, 
didn't really receive any training. It's possible to learn things without training. <laughs> Thank goodness. We wouldn't get very far. You got it. Well, so what, is, what was it like as a behavior analyst during your early years in the field? And that's, that's interesting. I, um, I don't know if I was lucky or not, but when I applied for a, a job, um, the one that popped up was one out in the uh, wild west of uh, what I called it then Temp, Arizona. I thought it would be a temporary spot for me. Hmm. Um, and in fact, a mentor said, don't go out to the West, Peter, because you're out of the intellectual mainstream and you might get lost and just sort of go into the woodwork there. But I was tired for the time being of the East. I wanted to spread my own wings and a place that was known as Fort Skinner in the desert made me an offer. And so that was Arizona State University. It, uh, it was called Fort Skinner in the Desert because a chairman of, at that time, um, Bachrock, uh, peopled it with lots of good behaviors and brought them out for seminars. And Charlie's seminar, a whole bunch of other good people were there. Izzy Goldiamond was there for quite a while, Bill mm -hmm. Verblenick. Um, when I arrived, I inherited friend Fred Keller's PSI class. He was there for a while. Um, and there were other good behaviors there. So there was you know, real over-representation of behaviorists uh, at this place, and a bunch of really great graduate students. And In fact, later on, we moved to sort of from great grad students to average ones, which were still pretty darn good. But I didn't, I was not at all impressed when I got with the grad students, because I was used to my colleagues at Harvard, and I didn't realize that people that dedicated and turned on and smart are not to be taken lightly. So I just, it was an easy transition for me. Uh, with smart grad students, amongst them Joel Meyerson, uh, Rick Shaw, um, and a bunch of other people that uh, many of uh, the listeners to this interview would recognize. So it was an easy transition. There was not much of a reduction in reinforcement in my life uh, when I got out to ASU. And, and I was in a context that locally appreciated behavior analysis. Uh, but uh, as time went by, um, other, other people came into power at the place and other people get hired, got hired in. And so I was sort of the last, uh, the last Indian at Alamo, if there <laughs> were Indians. I guess that's a mixed metaphor. But anyhow, I was uh, one of the last behaviorists there until um, we were, they were lucky enough to hire a young man by the name of Federico Sanabria as a colleague. And so that was easy, and I found it easy to teach Skinner and to teach behavior analysis because it, it's so fresh to so many people. You know? I've always loved the science and human behavior. The science part is outdated, but the behavior analysis is as sharp as it was the day he, he wrote it. And when students read it, they just it's sort of like, wow, I never thought of it that way, you know? And I hadn't either. So there's a lot of reinforcement from students that got channeled down from Skinner uh, through me to the students, and I got the wow effect that he was denied because he wasn't there at the time, <laughs> but he, he, he got plenty of it, I'm sure. Uh, so the students received the idea as well. The personalized system of instruction worked great for many years, and when it got stale, I replaced it with a more collaborative learning enterprise, which is very behavioral once again. And so in terms of the... And colleagues were always respectful. So it was very easy for me to be a behavior analyst at that time, but then I wasn't out in the community trying to change behaviors. Uh, Lee Meyerson was an applied behavior analyst there, and I think he had a little bit harder time of it interacting with kids and working with autistic kids and the community around. And there was one other... Later on, I think you said you'd be asking me about what I want to remember for, so I want to get this off my chest. I have to make a confession about something I want to be forgotten for. Now, you might say it's not wise to say something I want to be forgotten for when there's an audio-video record being made of it, but one student I discouraged from working with me wound up going and working in the ag department and got her, her degrees there and went on for a PhD. And she was a lovely person, but I had a, a lot of good people coming in that year and I had unfair doubts about her ability to make it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, she is now certainly the most famous autistic person around. Semple Brenner. 
It's Temple Grandin. That's exactly right. <laughs> and if you ever saw that lovely HBO movie uh, about her, which is quite good, um, they they have a character that's very uh, snotty about her, and I think I think that was supposed to be me. And so this is my apology. All of those that work with autistic kids or are autistic, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, and so that's one thing I would do differently: is um, pay attention to people with special um, you know, gifts, handicaps, or gifts, however they play out, and uh, enjoy their what their perspective on life is. And she has certainly uh, enriched our understanding of what it's like to be an autistic person. So. Um, I guess I hadn't been around enough, enough applied folks at that point in time to be more open-minded than I was, but maybe things have changed. It sounds like you learned both from your mentors and your students and I respective learned, students. I mean, that's why we teach. We learn our minds are open so much from our students. And that student I learned a lot from, even though she wasn't, unfortunately, my student, but so many that are and ask questions and... Um, and recognize the value of what we're doing, or the lack of value if we're teaching things that are stupid and we get a chance to reflect on them. Um, teaching students keeps our minds open. If our minds are open to start with, they fill them with fresh and useful and good things. That's well put. Well, so what do you consider was your most important contributions to behavior analysis? And uh, you've told me what you would like to be forgotten for, but what would you like to be remembered for? Well, that's almost harder. Um, I had fun. <laughs> I, I guess, you know what I'd like to be remembered for, April? Hmm. For the best keynote address given at ABBA in 2034. <laughs> Fantastic answer. But a lot, of, a lot of my other research is being remembered. Um, I don't know if I want to be remembered for it, but uh, people like my behavioral theory of timing. Mm -hmm. And that was a theory that I cooked up with Greg Fetterman, uh, a wonderful postdoc and colleague now for many years. He came out to work with me, and we went out, we drove to California to visit with Ed Fantino and Ben Williams and just talk shop and, and introduce each uh, my, my new colleague. Well, way back, it was a lovely drive back with him across the desert looking at the skies and and pondering, well, what are we going to do that's going to get you a job, Greg? Because he'd given up a tenure-track job to work with me. We have to do something. What do you think about this new theory that Gibbons gotten out, uh, the scalar expectancy theory, SCT? You know, and, and Gibbons is a smart and wonderful guy, or was. He passed a number of years ago, unfortunately. Um, but the theory was very complicated, and put more computational abilities in a rat's brain than I think are there. So I said, I'll tell you what, let's do a parody. We're going to do a parody. And we're going to do a theory like his, but instead of being a cognitive theory, we're going to say, no, it's all behavior. So his theory was SCT. What do we call ours? We'll call ours uh, BET, Behavioral Theory of Timing. And let's see how simple we can make it. It'll break real quick, but we'll just make some simple. And uh, that's one of my, if not my most highly cited articles, uh, the paper that Greg and I wrote on behavioral theory of timing. And so having fun uh, is worthwhile. Other stuff, um, I was always fascinated by schedules of reinforcement. And I, uh, I always, I mean, in science, there are levelers and sharpeners. Uh, and you have to know that when you're talking to other colleagues, or otherwise you understand where they're coming from. And sharpeners are people that are always saying, you know, it's not really quite like that, though. What about Schmendrup's results? Don't those really, aren't those an issue? Blah, blah, blah. Or, eh, the data is not perfect and everything. It's extremely important to have these people that have an eye for detail and uh, uh, a clear ability to criticize in the field. Then there are people like me that want to try and s simplify everything, unite everything, level everything, sharply. So, uh, Schmendrick's results, yeah, but that was done in thus and such. Well. So I see all these schedule of reinforcement effects, and they're phenomenal. Skinner, first year Skinner's got this huge book of cumulative records, and I keep thinking, how can you unify and bring a coherent framework for understanding them? I wasn't going to be able to 
give a perfect theory of all of them, what I was aiming for was a set of principles that you had to agree on, or, or if you didn't, okay, do something else different. But these were low-level, reasonable verbal principles, yeah. uh, you know, like there are ceilings on rate of, reinfor rate of responding, and that reinforcers direct as well as empower behavior, things like this. Um, and then from that do some models that I thought were the best, but, you know, they would evolve and be dispensable. And so the framework were the principles, and the models were the best current ones to flesh, flesh it out in terms of predictions. So I call that mathematical principles of reinforcement. I st that was done almost 20 years ago, and I still think it's very good. Um, but it was too quantitative for a lot of people in the field to really get their teeth into. Um, and periodically I'll go back and re-examine it and generate, we've most recently, a model for progressive ratio uh, responding from it. And it's still valid and still strong, but doesn't have too much of an audience, I'm afraid. Then I've done stuff outside the field. Um, I'd really like it if my statistic P rep, the probability of replication, um, were more viable. Um, it is viable. We're more appreciated and used. But um, there's some very good statisticians that had the NIH problem with it. Mm -hmm. I, maybe, no, I don't think I'm being unfair to them. You, you, know, you know what the NIH problem is, don't you? I think you can say it better. It's the not invented here problem. And um, I hadn't sort of paid my dues by joining a particular club, let's put it that way, at which point I think every, everybody would be happy with it. So anyhow, they were fairly... Um, vociferously object, ob objected to it fairly vocifer vociferously. Um, and it's still a very good statistic. It's valid. It works. It predicts replicability of effects. Um, I'd like to see that take off again. Um, and then other work I've been doing on ADHD I think is very important and I'd like to see that have some legs. Well, I'm glad you actually bring up the, the PREP statistic because I... I happen to think that that's somewhat important. Thank so you. It's, it's nice that you've heard of it, April. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Um, it's good. It's easy to compute. Uh, I've got an encyclopedia chapter coming out for anybody that wants oh. an easy introduction to it. And what's nice about it in this latest avatar, um, as N of 1, as uh, behaviorists that care about the individual case, uh, it's easy, I figured out, I knew, and then in this article I threw it in, that the statistic as it is predicts replicability at, uh, under certain assumptions. Like you're doing this very similar experiment with the same number of uh, subjects and mm -hmm. the same power predicts replicability. But it also lets you predict the replicability if you've got an N of 1. And so let's suppose you've got a, a phenomenon sort of established in the field and you want to know if it's going to work for Sharon or not. Well, every Sharon is different, every situation is different, but you just use the statistic with an N of 1 in replication, the probability of replication will decrease because of idiosyncratic variabilities, and it's always probabilistic, but it gives you a decent estimate, depending on how strong the original findings are, the effect size and such. Uh, it gives you a decent estimate of replicability for the N of 1 case as well. So. Uh, yeah, I would like to see it explored, and I'm thrilled that you heard of it. Well, if you don't mind my um, elaborating, what do you think that um, the replicability statistic does that um, normal null hypothesis testing maybe <sighs> tries to do? No, it doesn't try to do it. Or, or people think it does. It can't do it. Without. Well, you said, um, uh, without now you've got me going. Anything. Now you've got me going, you see. <laughs> um, it's, everything is probabilistic. Um, in this world. So when I say probability of replication, it's not like you can bet the farm on it, but it's a good estimate forth forthcoming. What does null hypothesis permit you to do, and why is PREP better? Well, um, Fisher knew, and he said explicitly, that uh, null hypothesis testing, his version was different than Neyman and Pearson's, lets us make no quantitative predictions about how valid the hypothesis is or whether it's viable or not. Uh, 
and that's because of this simple quirk of logic that bedevils all inferential statistics. When you say, what's the probability of the data given the null? You're assuming the null to do the statistics, and he had to the way he was doing it. And let's suppose you get a highly significant effect. Would you reject the null? If you get a highly significant effect? Yeah. Well, you're taught to reject the null, but yes. I couldn't reject yes. the null. Yes, and the fact. teacher should know better. Because what you could do with extremely significant data, no issue there, you can say these data are extremely unlikely to have come under the null hypothesis. You can reject the data given the hypothesis. But to reject the hypothesis given the data is turning logic backwards. You know, it's like saying, you know, uh, what's the probability of being uh, wearing a tie given that you're a president? Almost all the time, close to one. Okay. And to use the null hypothesis to say that uh, the hypothesis receives, receives report or you're rejecting the null is like turning that around and saying, well, what's the probability of a president of you know, being a president given that you're wearing a tie? That must also be one. No, it's not one, <laughs> because they're different conditional probabilities. Mm -hmm. And you can get from one to the other using Bayes' theorem. But to do that, you need priors. And nobody's got priors. And so other things are done. So you cannot reject the null, and you cannot accept the null. You cannot accept the alternative. Neyman and Pearson has, have other issues, a nice variant on the theme, but there are other things you can't do with me. There's nothing you can do with null hypothesis testing. Model comparison works. PREP can tell to you the probability, not of your hypothesis being true, but of the probability of replicating the data. And isn't that what we're interested in anyway? Well said, April. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, because, you know, knowing the truth is given to gods and seers and crazy people. Uh, <laughs> what we've got as scientists is uh, hypotheses and replicability, and good hypotheses, good theories, good models have high replicability. Thank you for elaborating on that. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I really wanted to. All right, so how do you think that behavior analysis has changed um, over the extent of your career? If we can oh, it, it, it sort of changed like my university, Arizona State, has changed. When I went there, sort of a frontier university, a lot of good people trying to do good things, but, you know, some people didn't have a clue what to do, administration and faculty and students, and, you know, it was happening. And now it's, it's a very well-oiled, well-organized um, institution with a lot of richness and diversity in it. Um, a lot of arguments, too, but that's healthy. And behavior analysis, when I started, was in its infancy, or its toddler stage. Um, it, um, I think it suffered for a while because of Skinner's um, disinterest in theory. And so it, I think the, the growth of it was a little bit stalled by being overly empirical, which is always good to be empirical, but not at the price of equally quick growth of theory to go with it. So I started out in an extended juvenile period of behavior analysis. But over the last 20 years, uh, it's really matured. And I, I see an incredible, and I see it primarily in, in the ABI uh, conferences, because that's where I see the most of it incredible diversity of sharp intellectual interest uh, covering behavior, which is what psychology is all about, covering behavior from all aspects, some of them more solid than others, all of them hopeful, many of them tremendously creative. So it's gone from really good ideas by brilliant founders to really good science and uh, community enrichment through the basic and applied behavior analysis. Whoa, what a, an amazing growth it's seen in the time I've been alive. Well, so is there anything in your career that you would do differently? We've covered that maybe. <laughs> but personally, I'd be um, a little broader in the beginning, yeah. uh, reading a little bit more outside uh, behavior even. And um, well, what else would I do? I'd try more crazy things. <laughs> I'd get outside the Skinner box. I spent 
first most of my career inside the Skinner box, and I, I try to. I think that was a local minimum. You know, you, the, the Skinner box technology was really good, and then it got hyper automated. Got hard to do other things in it. It always was rats and pigeons in a box. And mm -hmm. context, we know, is so important. And the ability to take the boxes apart and do something with them is hard for students now because they're so electronic. And so I think that was a great leap forward and, and a half of a leap slide back. And we've got to find some way to re-engage. I would have if I could do differently, but now the technology is there to re-engage with the world at large. Yeah, that's an interesting point. You had mentioned that throughout your career that you sort of started out by surrounding yourself with um, with colleagues that were very behavioral and then you moved to, a, to, to the West where you had more colleagues that were very behavioral. And do you think that um, that sort of um, mixing, what are the positives and negatives of that? Is there a, a, an influence um, toward not collaborating to other, with other um, schools of thought is, or is there... Um, something that would uh, allow... Well, you're full of good questions, yeah. April. Mm -hmm. Great interviewer. I haven't thought about that, but, you know, someone, I guess many people, pointed out that evolution, we, we understand a lot about evolution, hell of a lot more than we did 50 or 100 years ago. And one thing we know is that variation in selection and mutation are important for um, evolution of new species. And ABBA is a new species of uh, scientific endeavor. And what that takes is, if you have a bird that can fly a little bit better, or any animal that has, through some mutation or sexual recombination, made an advance, but it's mixed in with the population at large, it's likely that that variant will get swamped, mixed in the, lost in the mix. Mm -hmm. And so where you find the greatest speciation is island uh, biogeographies, island, islands themselves or sky islands. And like in Arizona where I am, you have the, the spotted owl. What is that? Well, it retreated to the mountaintops when the uh, mm -hmm. climate dried out and speciated there and is allopatric in that it's separated in space and time, so it's its own species. It could probably blend, breed with other uh, owl types but if it's there much longer, it won't. And so some people argue that what you need for new species is isolation at first. And I think that it was not bad in the early stages of the field. Uh, there are different mechanisms of isolation. One is mountaintops, and I had my desert retreat. Um, others are jargon. And jargon itself is a barrier to communication of ideas, which keeps them from getting watered down, which in the beginning is not bad. But then, then you start growing things like spotted owls with too many spots or something, but they're getting by fine and they don't fly too well. And they're really not terribly viable long term. And so soon after this early stage, I think it's really important for there to be outbreeding. Mm -hmm. And what I like about the society with the BF Skinner lectures and other modes, they see that too, and they're trying to bring... Um, people from outside into behavior analysis and getting us to go out to other conventions is important too. So uh, in some ways during the early part of my career I was lucky that I had my little island retreat out there. I think it lasted too long um, and there are colleagues in, in the zoology department and in the sociology department that I could have been pro profitably interacting with in the education department but life was comfortable. <laughs> And so I, I got too comfortable doing my thing. I think the same is true with JAB. It's a great journal for technical operant stuff, but sometimes it, people in it cite primarily work that's in it and don't mm -hmm. reach out. To, uh, and I, so I'd like to, when you're going to ask me advice to students, I'd like to see all young practitioners of behavior analysis periodically attempt to and publish articles in other journals mm -hmm. because that will give them review by critics that um, are able to um, criticize them work from other perspectives that may not have thought of and to learn how to reach other audiences and to learn from those other audiences. So some isolation is good. Mutual support is good. Don't let people from different perspectives kill your dreams. Uh, and at the same time, listen to their dreams and see if they take you somewhere too. 
Well, what, um, what areas of the field would you like to see more work in, whether it's collaborative and outbreeding or in more inbreeding? I like it that both questions had breeding in them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I recently um, discovered, well, a couple of years ago, uh, in part through a colleague, Art Glenberg, um, the fascinating work that's going on in embodied cognition. Now, embodied cognition is an approach done by cognitive psychologists, started by them, in which they, they recognize that thinking doesn't just all happen in the brain. But it happens in the body. It happens in the environment. Now, Skinner talked about it in verbal behavior when he talked about audience control. Uh, an instructor or a lecturer can say things in front of an audience. He can't say elsewhere because he doesn't have that kind of stimulus control of the audience. Uh, the picture on your wall I can respond to as a discriminative stimulus. I can be colored by the, my talk, what I'm saying, the color of my discourse could be colored by the color of the art on your wall. Uh, and so part of that is affecting me. But there are so many neat experiments that have been done demonstrating that how we hold our bodies, the physical temperature, the motion, the habituation to stimuli around us, the ability to move our face in certain ways, all strongly influence our thinking. And by that, they influence our verbal behavior and our subsequent voting behavior. And so he is taking, he and his colleagues working in embodied cognition uh, are taking their questions a big step towards behaviorists. And I want behaviorists to go out and take their knowledge of behavior and use it to address questions that cognitive psychologists have been curious about, and, and they're not very different than the questions we ask. Um, and say, hey, finally, we can get rid of this stupid schism between cognitivism <laughs> and behaviorism and do really fascinating work on mutual things. And I think because of them, and hopefully because of us, we're going to see a whole new enriched view of what it is to be human, and it means we think in every part of our body. Uh, my friend Art is now doing uh, experiments with children in schools, having them use their fingers to help do numbers. You know, you're told in schools not to use your fingers. But in point of fact, our fingers twitch when we do numbers. They still do. Uh, he did an experiment on women that were having Botox for uh, plastic surgery to get rid of crow's feet. When you do that, the muscles are poisoned. You can't go like that. And so he found it took him much longer to figure out whether a, a bunch of words made a true sentence or not, it's called the lexical decision task, much longer if they were about a negative situation than a positive one. Because thinking about negative situations, help, this helps. It, it can't do that, it can't think so well about negative situations. And there are lots of experiments like this that are cool, that show how embodied we are. And so thinking is not, you know, Skinner was right to be skeptical of the enlightenment to put it all up here. Thinking is embodied. Uh, um, we don't. We we do it to plan action. We try things out to see if they'd work. I'm using my hands. Everyone uses their hands. Well, why? A lot of extra wasted effort. It's not wasted. We can't think without it. So, I would like to see behaviors get more into thinking behavior writ large in their body and to meet the cognitives halfway that are doing this. It'd be great fun. Well, that could be a whole other conversation in of itself. Oh yes. Yeah, fun to elaborate definitely. on that. So what do you think is the future of behavior analysis? Ahead of us. <laughs> uh, you know, most species, animal species that have ever lived, the vast majority of them have ended, and their lines have ended. It's not just the species have ended. Mm -hmm. Whatever progeny they have snuffed out, either over the long term or the short term. I, I think that's going to be true of most organizations. And that may be true of behaviorism. It's time maybe, you know, um, early 21st century, and that's it. But hopefully, the science and the principles, the empiricism, which is the most important part, um, will live and live behind beyond us. So, you know, every every parent, it seems, want their kids to look like them. Yeah. They name them like them. They want them to look like them. They don't want monsters. But mutation is what makes the hope of the future. 
And so I think we have to be tolerant of mutations in what we do to see if they're viable, incorporate them if they are. And I think we've got such good stuff, got such good mojo. If we don't strangle our own babies, I think we've got a great future. Um, but it may not be something that will even be called behaviorism or behavior analytic approach in the future, as long as it retains the core values of good science, empiricism, attention to behavior, and the use of those principles in enriching the world of both healthy and less than healthy people around us. Um, it would be wonderful if we evolve. When, when we evolve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already growing an extra year somewhere, I think. <laughs> All right, so if we could la wrap up just with the, I, I know you already gave a little bit of advice, but do you have any more advice that you would give to future students of behavior analysis? You know, the, who the best advice is just to sort of behave well and hope they're paying attention and to, to model it. Um, but um, you, you remember Isaac Asimov's uh, iRobot and the three principles for mm -hmm. robots of, uh, you know, um, do no harm, serve your master, and, and do other things. Well, I think similar principles like that are really important. Uh, do no harm, and it's easy to do harm by being overly blinkered about your technique working better maybe than it is, or for this population rather than that. And to give advice based on solid principles that may really not be applicable. So um, get your head out and make sh look at the larger context and make sure you're not doing harm. I remember when I was a uh, uh, younger, back in the great old 60s and early 70s, there was a paper, Behavior Principles for Radicals, that argued that, wait a minute, training kids to be orderly in school and quiet when they should be and so forth. Whom are we serving? Are we serving those children or are we serving the establishment? Should we be using our principles to make them well behaved if they're in context where a sane person would be ill behaved? I hadn't thought of that, for God's sakes. Um, and you, as students, need to think about that for yourselves also. Whom are you serving? Um, be scientific. Before even you're being a behaviorist, it's more important to be scientific. It's important to be a behaviorist, and hopefully everything we as behaviorists do is scientific. But um, you know, check the data, have, have a larger context, know where it fits. Um, talk to people. Talk to people that you don't like even. You might come to like them. Um, find out what motivates colleagues down the hall. And even though they're not uh, behavioral, you'll find very similar questions and real enthusiasm for what they're doing. And you'll learn. You'll learn. Um, so being open-minded, I think. Taking all the math that you can. Um, and when it stops being doable, stop doing it. But uh, it never hurts in terms of data analysis and computer skills. Data analysis give you another language to couch things in. Um, so, um, and looking at other kinds of approaches to your subject, whether it be the anthropology or biology or genetics or, or whatever the other potentials are. So, both be narrow in your, going, not narrow, but deep in the strengths that you get. And for that, you have to be a little narrow, but being broad also in what you can bring to bear on them. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure it's talking with you, today. April, and talking with you all. Uh, have a good one. Behave well. <laughs>